May it please the Court, Bradley Silverman along with Mr. Benjamin Daniel on behalf of the appellant. The trial court dismissed the appellant's second amended complaint uh, with prejudice um, on the sole basis that the plaintiff had not alleged, sufficiently alleged in the eyes of the trial court, uh, cognizable damages in a claim for uh, civil conspiracy. Uh, our position is the trial court erred and that the, looking at the four corners of the second amended complaint, that the plaintiff, Mr. Mr. Anthony, has alleged damages which, if the facts alleged in the complaint are proved, would entitle him to, entitle him to an award of damages. I don't think there's any dispute in this case between the parties as to the legal principles that govern this case. This is a pure pleadings case. I think the trial court got somewhat sidetracked by her view as to what she believed we would be able to prove were this case permitted to proceed to discovery and to trial. Um, the argument has been made by the appellees that the damages that were alleged were purely speculative. The cases that they cite in their brief are all negligence cases dealing with issues of proximate cause. They are primarily summary judgment and post-trial cases, not dismissal cases. Um, and uh, really, you look at the second amended complaint. Uh, we've cited in our brief the paragraphs where the damages were alleged. We don't think we could have been any clearer as to the types of damages that are being sought in this case, and that they're very specific. They're not speculative. They're provable. Um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, I don't think that the court gave any other reason as grounds for dismissal. I don't believe that the defendant. About Judge Salter's uh, concurring opinion. Well, Judge Salter. I understand. I'm not saying it. I agree, else. Judge Salter. That could have been a basis for her ruling. Well, it could have. And Were it was, it correct or not? Agree, and I think it was something that influenced her. But at the <clears> same <throat> time, if you look at that first opinion, the two Judge Suarez and Judge Rothenberg decided that issue of statute of limitations on a finding that the damages as alleged were what triggered the statute. If that court had not felt that there were damages, recognizable damages pled, then I think that court would have been motivated to simply say, you don't have a claim here. Doesn't, your, your statute of limitations Well, they weren't run. faced with that issue. Uh, correct. And, and, and to, his, to his credit, Judge Salter was talking about his gut feeling about what he saw based on something that wasn't briefed or argued at that time. And in fact, based on a prior complaint, not the complaint that was ultimately before Judge Leesfield when this case was dismissed. Um, Judge Cohen Lando had asked, had, had ordered Mr. Anthony to amend his complaint after the first remand, which was done. The complaint was condensed. It was cleaned up. Um, as Judge Salter had indicated, uh, Mr. Anthony hired additional counsel to advise him on this case. Mr. Daniel has been on the case since the prior appeal. And so we cleaned everything up. We think that we've adequately alleged the elements. Nobody con contests on this side the, what the elements of a claim for civil conspiracy are. Uh, this is a pure pleadings case. There may be issues of proof down the road. There may be some elements of the damages that they might want to claim are speculative, some which aren't. Again, I think at a motion to dismiss stage, it's inappropriate to tell Mr. Anthony that he doesn't have the right to proceed to discovery in an attempt to marshal the evidence to prove his case. Um, and so on that, on that uh, point, unless the court has any other questions, I, would, uh, I guess I'll reserve two minutes of my time uh, to respond. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Hi, good morning, your honors. Kristen Tajak with Cole Scott and Kassane on behalf of the Appellees. Uh, first, uh, as you all know, um, this case arises out of a highly contentious divorce proceeding um, involving the appellant and his former wife, Mrs. Anthony, whom the appellees represented in relation to the divorce proceedings um, between the couple. And um, in, in the second amended complaint, the appellant has alleged that um, the Appellees were involved in a civil conspiracy with uh, Mr. Anthony's former wife, um, and as an overt act in furtherance of that conspiracy, um, the appellees uh, conspired to take confidential business records from Mr. Anthony's law firm. And in addition, the complaint alleges that the uh, parties would cover up that alleged conspiracy by insisting upon Mr. Anthony's execution of a release in relation to the divorce proceedings, a release of the appellees. Um, the trial court dismissed the second, second amended complaint, finding that the alleged damages were purely speculative. And um, 
According to the allegations in the complaint, the documents taken from the law firm included the names of uh, clients of the firm, as well as social security numbers of employees of the firm, in addition to financial um, tax information and financial records. Um, yet the damages that were allegedly incurred as a result of the conspiracy consist of increased legal expenses um, from a prolonged litigation when uh, Mr. Anthony refused to execute the release. Didn't, counsel, didn't, didn't, um, didn't uh, you folks concede that this case would have settled but for that hearing conceded that this case would have settled but for the release issue? Uh, no, no, was I don't. Was that not stated at one of the, one of the hearings? I, I don't believe it is, Your Honor. Um, I believe that there's a question as to whether it would have settled. I, I, Mr. Anthony's position was that it would have settled had um, the parties not insisted upon the execution of release. Um, but that issue is certainly unclear from the record, and um, and uh, the damages, in addition to um, the increased legal fees, um, there were temporary but you alimony said, it's in your Maybe it's in your brief. You say, it is entirely clear from the allegations of the Second Amendment complaint that the two mediations failed due to Anthony's own refusal to settle the divorce case because he did not want to provide a release to the law firm. Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. That was that was alleged in the complaint. I mean, if that's the only reason. Well, that was the allegation, that he refused to execute the release, and therefore um, the divorce proceeding was prolonged, and he incurred all of these additional legal expenses, um, fees from uh, taking that was withdrawal. If that was the reason, then do we not just ask whether or not there are potential damages out of this? Well, in order for, for the damages to uh, be sufficient to support the claim for civil conspiracy, they would have had to arise out of the wrongful conduct taken in furtherance of the conspiracy. Well, he's alleging uh, damages from that date forward, I suppose, additional attorney's fees, plus perhaps what he had to pay to the ex-wife. I'm not sure about all of that. Additional borrowings and some penalties and interest. Does that not, would that not, not flow? This is a tort case. Would that not flow? Well, flow from the from the alleged wrong, if it's proven. Well, here the alleged wrong was the wrongful taking of the confidential business records. The act of um, insisting upon uh, the appellants executing a um, release in relation to the divorce proceedings was not in any way wrongful, and um, well, it was meant to protect the firm uh, and Mr. Perez Abreu from any liability as a result of what was perceived as a conspiracy with um, the wife to take the confidential records. Right. It sort of flows together. Well, it does, but the act of insisting upon a release was not in any way wrongful. And um, the trial court pointed that out um, at the hearing, and she said that you know, people are allowed to ask for a release of divorce that, that, proceedings. That, that, that's they right. The the I mean, the, the problem I have is we're on a motion to dismiss. If we were on a motion for summary judgment, maybe it'd be, but we're on a motion to dismiss, and rarely do you deal with this issue of damages as a basis for dismissal, unless they're so entirely speculative that they're not even within the realm of reason, and as Judge Shepard points out, there's at least some correlation to them. Well, they're, they really are speculative in that um, they resulted from Mr. Anthony's refusal to settle the proceedings. It was his decision whether or not to continue with the litigation. Um, he Well, you know, in a divorce proceeding, uh, when the law firm is asking for a release of whatever they did so that you can settle the divorce case, and to me that seems to be outside of the matters involving the divorce proceeding itself. It means, you know, if we were involved in any misconduct, we want to be off the hook before we settle this, and we're going to advise the, our client not to settle until you sign such a release. That seems to me to be collateral. And not really something that you would determine in a settlement in a divorce proceeding. But that's beside the point, isn't it? <laughs> I, mean, I guess the point here is, was the trial court uh, correct in dismissing on a motion to dismiss because she felt that the damages were speculative? 
What is clear from the allegations in the second amended complaint is that the two mediations failed due to the appellant's refusal to settle because he did not want to provide the release. Due to appellee's insistence on a release. That's right, but there's nothing wrongful about insisting upon a release or prolonging the divorce proceedings and and any fees and, and costs that he incurred as a result of um, early withdrawal from his retirement account or a loss of fair market value on the marital home, those are all speculative in relation to the alleged conspiracy of taking the documents from his office. Um, you know, I, I presided over many dissolution cases. And to me, it seems inappropriate, whether the law supports it or not, for a law firm to get in the way of a settlement between a husband and a wife and their children because the law firm wants a release. That just doesn't seem to me to fit in the scheme of uh, settling the divorce case so that the parties can go on their way and the children can be properly cared for. But I guess that's not the issue here either, right? That's right, Your Honor. Um, based upon these allegations... Well, there is an issue as to who the proper plaintiff is. This, the, if there was any wrong done, it was done to a PA, correct? That's correct, and Not Mr. Anthony. That's correct, and, and there are no was that argued? Was that argued below? Um, that was not specifically argued below, although um, it was pointed out at the hearing that none of the damages alleged um, relate to any uh, client of the law firm or employee of the law firm, um, that these damages are speculative in relation to the taking of those particular documents, and um, the law furnishes a remedy only for such wrongful acts as result in injury or damage. And I guess if there is a next time, it will be argued next time, right? <laughs> um, if Your Honors have no further questions, we would just state that there are no damages in this case arising from the alleged wrongful conduct, which was the taking of documents in furtherance of this conspiracy. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Silverman, we'll give you one minute. Your Honor, I'll be extremely brief. I just want to address that last question that you asked about the difference please, between the PA please and do. Why, why can we not, why can we not, um, under what we, um, in more modern times, call a drunken cabbie, it's a, it's a, it's a tipsy coachman? It's a, it's, yes, you have it. It is, uh, it, it was invented here. Uh, the issue, why can we not um, affirm that, this case? Well, Your Honor, that issue was actually briefed, and we addressed that issue in our brief. Would you, Mr. Would, Anthony, would, is you, the one. would you permit us to do it de, de novo? If you, well, I think your, your standard of review is de novo, regardless on an, on, a, on an order granting a motion to dismiss with prejudice. But the point is this: the, there are no, the law firm's not claiming any damages. The theft of the, the conspiracy as alleged in the complaint was the theft of the documents and the attempt to cover it up and the coercion of Mr. Anthony through the divorce proceeding, as, as Judge Fernandez has indicated, which we believe was extremely wrongful and extremely inappropriate. The damages were to Mr. Anthony. He paid the attorney's fees. He had to deplete his retirement accounts. He had to pay the, the additional alimony. It, the law firm didn't have to pay those, incur those damages. This was a tort personal to Mr. Anthony. The law firm, the stealing of well, the documents from his law tort, firm was... If, if the tort were at, to the law firm, then he could give all the releases he wanted and everybody else could, and the law firm was left available, correct? Well, originally, and, I, and this may be outside the record, I don't recall because I have been... Tell us, you have, you have only about 15 minutes, 15 seconds left, not 15 minutes. I don't recall so what the original no, terms... Stay, of stay, the, stay with the record. Okay. And in that case, Your Honor, I, we would just respectfully request that you uh, reverse the order of dismissal and allow this case to proceed to discovery. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank We're you. We're being recessed.